everybody. Um, before we jump into, we've got one hearing tonight. Before we start that, uh, we have the public comment section of the program. So if, if there's only three of you here tonight, if any one of you is here for anything that has to do with anything other than the hearing, uh, just raise your hand and we can hear what you've got to say. No? Okay. That being said, we're going to jump into uh, the first hearing, which is scheduled for 7 o'clock, if I can find the right paperwork. Four, a site plan review for daycare center by Jonathan Fogelson at 11 Ormond Drive, Florence map ID 23D-37, as advertised on July, no, when is this advertised? August 28th, August 28th and, and, September. and September 4th. So, to start things off, do we have a presentation? We don't have a presentation. I'm Jonathan Fogelson. Um, the application was submitted online, um, and I don't have a presentation per se, mainly because I'm most importantly not asking for any modifications to the property. So I have nothing to present. Um, I'd like to uh, begin by apologizing. Uh, the real applicant behind the scenes, if you will, is my wife, Candace. She operates an in-home daycare at our home at 11 Norman Drive. She's not here because she's recovering from a C-section. So I'm happy to say that we have a new uh, Northampton resident in our family, but unfortunately the real applicant isn't here. So uh, I might be limited in terms of my capacity, depth of breadth of daycare operations to answer some of your questions. Um, uh, the only other uh, thing really to emphasize is that there is no physical presentation because we're not asking for any physical modifications to the property. Okay. So that being said, uh, any questions from the board? So how many people, how many children do you take care of now? Right now, uh, given uh, the, the, the uh, um, status, uh, there are 10 children in Candace's care in our in-home daycare. That's what's known as a large in-home daycare facility according to Massachusetts EEC. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it is the maximum allowable within an in-home daycare. And so I assume those are drop-off in the morning, pick up in the afternoon? There's drop-off typically between 8 a.m. and 8.30 a.m. Most of the children arrive closer to 8.30 a.m. Some of them occasionally will peter in a little bit after that, depending on the parent's work schedule. And many of them arrive by bicycle and by foot. Some of them, uh, close to 50% on a daily average, will arrive by car. And at 4 p.m. is the latest time for pickup, unless, of course, late pickup is arranged in advance. So most children are picked up anytime between 3.30 and 4.30, typically between 4 and 4.30. So when you say you aren't making any physical change, it, it, you know, the, the issue for us, or at least for me, will be the traffic that's added to Absolutely. the neighborhood. And so is, are you going to need to make any provisions for more people coming and going any more efficiently? or? That, that, that's a very good question. Um, Candace and I engaged in a preliminary conversation with the planning department of the town, um, and uh, it was our understanding that the best thing to do in order to begin this process is actually come before you and present what our requests are, and then to see if there are any requests or uh, uh, directives by the board that we engage in any kind of modifications. Regarding traffic, um, one thing that I can say, Ormond Drive is effectively the driveway to the high school parking lot. Mm -hmm. um, it would be really difficult for our daycare center to even meet the maximum flows during the day. Uh, interestingly and fortunately, daycare operations, both drop-off and pick-up, do not coincide with high school drop-off and pick-up. So we wouldn't be adding to the daily maximum. If anything, we would be adding some traffic counts indeed, but during other part, parts of the day. By switching, sorry, Kevin. Just to clarify, um, aren't there a couple other entrances to the high school parking lot? There are. Mm -hmm. So indeed. this isn't, Ormond isn't the entrance to the parking lot? It is, it, it, between 7 and 7.30 a.m. 
there are a lot of cars driving down our street. Yeah. But, but there's also, how many other entrances are there? Uh, as far as I know, there are, well, first of all, one can enter that very same parking lot from the other perpendicular street. One can, of course, also enter the high school from above, right? Um, but our street functions as a main artery into the high school drop-off area for everybody coming from the Florence direction and everybody coming across the bridge down by, um, at the other end of the Riverside Drive. So there's quite a bit of traffic coming through. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I don't recall by heart the number that I actually submitted as part of the application. Um, there, there, I did. I conducted an independent traffic count between 7 and 7:30 a.m. on a few uh, weekday mornings, and uh, the number was much higher than I expected. <clears throat> I was I was rather surprised. So, how many kids do you expect to have? Uh, excellent question. Um, based off of the square footage of the property, the square footage of the interior space of the home that is usable, and uh, Massachusetts EEC regulations, the maximum allowable number of children at the home, if it were to become a daycare center, would be 27 children. That would be the maximum allowable. We're not sure that EEC would actually give us a permit for 27. Um, but one always <coughs> hopes for the most, even if one doesn't necessarily achieve that. So you could theoretically have 27 cars coming to drop people Theoretically, off. we could have 27 cars coming to drop children off, yes. And, and I assume people don't ride their bicycles in the winter. Um, Typically. Not some of the people that I know around town. <laughs> but, but definitely not a majority. One thing to keep in mind also is that uh, the daycare does follow snow emergencies and snow delays. So anytime there is a snow emergency or a snow delay, there is not an operation. Um, is there staff other than the children your wife? I mean, will there be staff yes. coming and parking um, at the yes. site? Yes. Right, right now, um, my wife runs the daycare plus at any moment up to two, sometimes even three additional staff members. So right now, there are f maximum four staff members on the property. In addition to myself, I work out of a home office. Mm -hmm. So maximum on a typical day at our household, there are five adults working in the house. Yeah. Okay, With five cars? Uh, we're actually a three-car household. I'm kind of embarrassed to say my wife refuses to get rid of our old pickup truck. So each of the staff members comes with a car, and then between the two of us, we have three cars. Yeah. To, to answer your question specifically, if we were to have any more than 10 children in the house, sorry, any more than nine children in the house, if it were to be a center, would it require four staff members. Mm -hmm. And any more than 18 children in the house would require six staff members. So effectively, we'd be increasing the number of adults working at the property from maximum of five to a maximum of six. John? Um, two things. One is a clarification. Ormond Drive is directly across from the stadium parking lot. Yes, that's accurate. Right, which is the overflow where you can park without a parking permit. The main parking lot that for high school accurate. is that a is block down the street. Okay. That is accurate. Um, not that it doesn't get a lot of traffic for people who don't want to buy a permit, but Actually, most of the traffic, if I may interject, goes down. To if, they, if they go down, then oh, okay. they take a left and kind of go okay. up. Yeah, even though the road over there is a mess, I wouldn't drive there if I didn't have to. But I'm just trying to clarify. So, if you were to get the maximum, be 27 mm -hmm. plus six people plus six adults, mm -hmm. that's 33 people. Maximum yes. could be in the facility at one time. Yes. And do you plan for this to remain your home? That's a great question. Um, you can live in a daycare facility if it is designated as an in-home daycare facility. Once it operates as a daycare center, you're no longer allowed to use it as a residence. Not to say that in the future we wouldn't be able to relocate the daycare center, close it, and move back. It's just that you can't also operate the daycare center and also live there at the same time. No. That, that would contradict with EEC regulations. And what about your business there? It, it, I, I wouldn't even be allowed to be on the property more than an hour during business hours when the children are there. Unless I'm doing some daycare related work like plowing the driveway or hedging or who knows what. I wouldn't be able to just hang out there. 
Carl. D- thanks. Does your in home your own in home business bring? Uh, no, not at all. I, I I don't have any customers coming to the property at all. I do work remotely. Yeah, so I'm going to circle back around to traffic because yes. I, I trust that EEC will take care of the rules that Absolutely. make you operate in a way that we all would want you to operate. Absolutely. So I'm going to I'm going to act like that's somebody else's concern and it, all the rules are probably set. Um, if we were hearing an applicant from a new business, not necessarily your daycare business, but any new business, um, we might ask them to do a traffic plan. And what that would involve is getting some metrics for the kind of traffic, you know, how many employees you would have, how often people visit. I mean, obviously, you'd see it'd be very different for a drugstore or a office building. So those, those kind of numbers exist somewhere in traffic volume documents and that sort Absolutely. of thing. Absolutely. But we can, I don't see us doing that because it's pretty clear what your numbers are going to be. It's, it's unclear how many children you're going to end up. I mean, I think you've given us ranges, uh, but... The maximum is clear. Right. Just so we're worried about your employees and where they're going to park, and we're worried about the safe comings and goings of drop-off and handling. So um, I'm, I'm wanting you to tell me how the drop-off happens now, and, and you don't see it changing at all. That, that's a great question. What happens now, actually, is some parents arrive by foot and arrive on a bicycle throughout the year. Many parents do arrive by car. They don't all arrive exactly at the same time, uh, and the drop-off time is actually fairly short. Mm-hmm. Um, and this has to do with Candace's philosophy of the children coming to work and the parents not hanging out yep. at the kid's job, if you will. Um, and what happens actually rather often is uh, our, our driveway actually has three informal parking spots off of it. We typically use those during snow emergencies for our own cars. But sometimes people will pull into those and sometimes people will actually double park within the driveway itself. So we can informally fit five vehicles just on, uh, just on the property itself. Uh, but that is informal. It's absolutely informal. And the cars do block each other in. Okay? And everybody's friendly and collegial enough that it's never been an issue whatsoever. Most of the people do park on the street. And at times what's happened is people actually went off and parked at the high school overflow parking down by the, down by the stadium, which, um, if I may say, has been the highest and best use that I've ever seen to that parking area, except for the odd evening ball game when the whole neighborhood is then becomes a parking lot. Uh, so actually, the several times that I've seen parents park there, I was like, oh, that's great. Somebody's using that. How awesome. That's, that's how things work out these days. So typically, on, on, for the high school parking on that overflow lot, when the, the high school, the drop-off in the morning is earlier than an hour earlier or so oh, yeah. than, than your drop-off, at the end of that period, how full is that overflow parking lot typically? Oh, that's a great question. Um, There is one young man that regularly will park in the same exact spot, and except for that, on on a regular week day, I've rarely seen more than five to a dozen cars down there. So then jump ahead to end of school practice, your pickups four to 430. Uh, which may or may not coincide with after school athletics and so forth that do utilize <coughs> that parking lot. What just walk me That's through a that. very interesting question. I've tried to keep track of that and I've failed miserably. It seems as though high school after hour activities in that location are somewhat irregular and typically they're actually actually later in the afternoon is what I've noticed. They're typically only during the summer I haven't seen anything going on over there in the winter or even early in the spring or late in the fall. They're typically in the summer and and kind of, you know, adjoining weeks and they're typically later in the afternoon is what I've noticed. And and I have the privilege of noticing quite a bit because most of my work days are at home so I can see what's going on. Okay. A quick question about staff. So yes. you mentioned the drop-off time and the pickup time. 
um, what would a staff person's hours be? You know, um, how early would they be arriving? Staff, right now what happens is staff arrives half an hour earlier. They arrive at 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. and staff leaves half an hour later, 5 p.m. Um, sometimes there's quite a bit of flexibility, especially because we live there, so if somebody wants to drip their kid off really early in the morning, we just have breakfast with them. The staff doesn't have to be there, no problem. Sometimes a staff member wants to come in late for a person, no problem. Um, if, it, if, if, if the board will grant us uh, permission to operate the daycare center over there, what will happen is, is that uh, the daycare center will actually be divided into classrooms. Each classroom, maximum of nine children in a mixed age group. Um, from, from newborns to three years old, maybe even a little bit older than that. Each classroom, maximum of three classrooms, each classroom will have one of two staff members arrive half an hour early and one of two staff members leave half an hour late. So um, 8 a.m., three staff members arrive. Eight, just before 8.30, three more arrive. Mm -hmm. Just after 4.30, three leave. Around 5 p.m., three additional leave. And, and one of those six people, typically one of the three earlier morning ones and one of the three later afternoon ones, would be Candace, my wife. So I'm trying to imagine how the parking and drop-off would <clears throat> work. Um, do you obviously know it's a very narrow street and a busy street and a lot of people park on the street you have a double driveway but you have three cars parked in it you have five up to five staff who are going to park somewhere so how so say two or three cars arrive at the same time to drop off kids how would they do it well there's on street parking well if they're in, if it's not occupied by other vehicles I've, I've i drove down the street twice and both times it seemed like it was pretty busy if, if, cars if you drive by recently cars. if you drive by recently then those parked cars would have been parked cars associated with the current daycare operation <clears throat> um, except for once that I've noticed anybody ever parking on this street has that ever since we moved in about a year and a half ago has been either our guests or people that come for the daycare it's actually really interesting um, all of our other neighbors on the street have uh, driveways that are much larger than ours and except for one household that actually faces another street, all of the households are a single individual household as it currently stands. I'm not saying that that's a must or that it's even going to stay that way. But, but interestingly, we're the main users of the street except for that 7 a.m. to 7.30 a.m. high school rush. We really are effectively the only users of the street, which is which is rather odd. So you're saying that you expect that people dropping off kids, even if there's two or three or half a dozen, at the same time, would be able to park on the street. I would I would I would say that my personal expectation, as somebody that chooses to live in a town that has a, an urban fabric to it and an urban environment to it, for people to engage in parking on the street whenever possible, legally and safely and walk to their destination. So the answer is people, if uh, half a dozen people showed up and you have your three cars and your five staff people, mm -hmm. that all the people dropping off kids would park on the street and there would be ample room for them. The, the, either on the street itself or in adjacent streets. There's legal on-street parking throughout the neighborhood except for Riverside Drive. And I wouldn't want to be walking along Riverside Drive. I wouldn't endorse that whatsoever. People drive way too fast down that road. Uh, you mentioned the neighbors and uh, the, the way that they use the street. Have you talked with the neighbors? Yes. And can you just talk a little bit about what um, those conversations we've, we've have had? Gone? We've actually introduced this topic <coughs> to all of the neighbors on our street as well as a couple additional neighbors that face adjacent streets but effectively abut our street and they all seem to be completely unfazed by our, our uh, <clears throat> optimistic approach to our intent. What's uh, from a square footage standpoint how much is being gained by converting what currently isn't part of the daycare into the daycare center? You know what I mean? Uh, there's that, there would be zero change. 
Um, the entire home is currently licensed as a daycare, uh, in-home daycare facility. Right. Needless to say, the children don't play in our bedroom or my office, but officially, in the eyes of EEC, those spaces are part of the daycare. Right, but um, I guess I'm asking not officially, but, but practically, bedrooms or office space that currently are off limits to the kids, how much, R roughly, trying to get a feel if you have ten, 10 kids there now, sure. what, is, what is practical? Um, well, r roughly speaking, um, the, the daycare operations would, would extend from consuming just a little over a third of the household to consuming the entire interior square footage. And, and I'm saying roughly, and I'm being suggestive here, because uh, a fair large portion of the in indoor space is actually the kitchen and dining area. And that is very much a shared space, as you can imagine. So I could be there making myself a cup of tea and while the kids are having breakfast. So it's kind of, you know, how do I count that square? Mm -hmm. Okay. So one last touch on cars and parking. Um, I don't know that I feel comfortable thinking that a business is going to, if, even if it's an empty parking lot, overflow into a school parking lot. I don't, I don't like the assumption of that, but I do like hearing you say that there's parking on the streets. I'm, I, I'd like to think there's enough capacity there to hold the cars that you're talking about. I'm somewhat concerned about the safety of people, you know, walking their children to the daycare facility if they have to walk some distance but because um, I don't think there's a sidewalk there is Ormond there. Drive itself does not have a sidewalk um, but the all of the adjacent streets do have sidewalks and Ormond Drive happens to be a very short street and happens to be a street that people are fairly so, so I'm just kind of mulling over the, the parking lot story right. you know I mean in practicality it's available it's empty that's where the employees are probably going to end up parking I don't know how I feel about that that's not the business assumption that that I feel that I think we should be making even if it's the practical one that will happen but I do want to hear that there's enough parking on the street and then then I think I'll let practicality go where it goes right I'm, I'm almost inclined to, to think from a practical sense, it's almost akin to the uh, loosening the the requirements for downtown parking in the downtown in the business district, where ultimately, if it's not to the owner's benefit, you know, the owner's only going to do what is practical for them. And if they build a building and and suck up the entire footprint and don't allow parking near, and their business suffers because of it, then that's on them or maybe they'll modify their design because because of that same here if, if 27 kids proves impractical because people don't want to deal with the parking or lack thereof or the traffic and the the child count goes down because of that then maybe it'll settle in and making these numbers up in the 18 kid range because that's a happy medium where people can find parking and traffic isn't an issue yeah but I don't know if that's for us. I have another question that's that, that he can't answer, that it's very different than that. Should that wait until we're through with the public, or should we just go ahead and start talking about it? Well, we might as well throw it out. We're in well, what we've done with a area, what we would do, what, what wants to be done with an area that's got, let's just say, five houses in the vicinity is to turn one into a business and have it be closed at night. It's in a business. How many other options are there in a residential neighborhood to incrementally turn it into a business neighborhood? I, I, what happens if it happens three times and one person is left in a neighborhood where there's nobody there at night because it's now a business neighborhood? I mean, this is a funny arrangement that I don't quite understand. Yeah. And I don't know what other opportunities there are for this to occur once it, it has occurred like this why not other things so can you tell me well there are certain things in residential zoning that are allowed um, right. by site plan approval that aren't like your typical retail office commercial you right and so churches are one of those schools daycares um massage well, that's only by home business. In a residential district, you could potentially get a home business, in which case the primary use is still a residential. Right. Okay. Component. 
Okay. So in terms of converting completely to something where you're not going to have a residential component, it's really only schools, uh, places of worship, and um, uh, daycare facilities, really, okay. um, that are allowed. There may be a couple more um, in a residential district that would be allowed. I, I could pull up the table of uses, but it's generally those kind of institutional it just uses, seems like it could as opposed to a like you're incrementing use. into something else. So right. four of the six houses turned into mm -hmm. you know, exactly. full-time daycares. It, it, well, or something. Right. I don't know. That's why I wanted right. to. That's why I wanted to know. And interestingly, a couple. I mean, I don't think it ever went anywhere. But it, someone did come to my office in this um, for a house somewhere in this neighborhood. I don't know, it was Milton or somewhere. They wanted to um, operate a place of worship, convert the house mm -hmm. to. Um, um, uh, this different use. It never came to fruition, I don't think, but that's the other type of thing that you might, you know, instead of, you think of the sort of the um, standard um, traditional church locations, and they're all pretty much mapped out, but there are these other um, smaller So a um, small places. school could do the same thing. Right. So, you know, you have... It's just an interesting... Well, and part of it is because of the statutory um, exemptions for these types of uses. We I got it. I just didn't know how many them. there were and whether or not it's a slippery slope, I guess, right. is what I was wondering about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have probably more instances of home-based daycare, but we also all have a shortage of child care facilities in the city um, anyway. But... You mostly, I think probably the more common thing is to have some a smaller home base. Um, yeah, that care. part of it wasn't. It was a sort of basic alteration right. of right. a neighborhood, mm -hmm. theoretically at least, mm -hmm. um, into more of a business place without the intention being to have that happen. That's what I was really yeah. wondering about. Any other questions? We want to open it up to the public. Yeah, I'd like to hear from the public. Okay. Hmm. I've Thank got you. one more oh, before we do, though. Sorry, John. Um, do they play outside? Is there a noise issue? Yes. Uh, actually, that is, once again, you, you don't really care about EC regulations, <laughs> but um, per child, there's a square footage requirement of outdoor play space, and uh -huh. there is uh, X amount of minutes per day or whatnot that they need to be outside, barring weather. Right. And, and right now, we actually have a fairly generous side yard and backyard that are used for play. Fenced? Oh, yes, they must be. Well, actually, I'm sorry. They don't have to be fenced by law. Ours is fenced. Okay. And they will continue to be fenced. Thank Absolutely. You, Mark, I'm, I'm okay. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. We're going to open up to public comment. So if you may, may I take my seat? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, you just want to raise your hand and, and come up and state your name and address if anybody of the two remaining want to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay, well, let's leave it open while we discuss. So it. it like 70% of the things that come through here, it doesn't matter if we're talking about soccer or daycare, it comes down to it's traffic. traffic. Yeah. Um, it was, I should, I guess, speak to a letter uh, that we received from a Miss uh, Fanny Chalfin mm -hmm. on Milton Street, uh, who states, I would prefer that a temporary permit of two years be given for the daycare center on Ormond Drive as a private citizen unfamiliar with the ways in which the change could impact the neighborhood. I would prefer to have two years to assess that. If after two years everything functions well and no unforeseen inconvenience to the neighborhood is experienced, I would see no reason why a permanent permit should not be issued. Um, so that might be one thing to consider as far as the traffic and so forth um, is concerned. Possibly. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not hearing a huge groundswell of the neighborhood at, at the moment. You know, it's, um, if I, I, would, I would view that opinion, I, it, it's, an, <clears throat> it's a limitation on a business to not let them plan. Right. And so, I mean, I think there's, it, it sounds like, oh, an innocuous proposal, give them two years and see how it's going. And, and in truth, I'd love to, but I, from, I can see that as being a bit of a hardship, actually, if you're trying to plan a business change. <coughs> I think the other piece of it is that you'd want, this is site plan, so the use is allowed, and so you'd probably want to set parameters for what would happen as opposed to pulling back the permit might say, you might say, you know, if it is shown that 
um, you know, a certain amount of um, trips are generated during, um, you know, or parking is an issue, then they have to come back and have more on-site parking or something. But I think, but the other, or if you think that the number is a problem, then maybe the permit is limited to 18 kids or whatever the number is. Instead of what the state might allow, maybe it if you're concerned and I can't remember what the staff number was um, it didn't sound like the staffing would change that dramatically depending on the number of kids but you're still talking about parents coming to pick up and drop off you know if, um, which might have actually more of an impact because it's coming and going it's going twice in yeah. that small period of time as opposed to staff that would be coming and staying yeah I, I'm still of the frame of mind that somebody else will worry about that knows much more about this business than I do will we'll have scaled that by rules for them to operate by mm -hmm. I'm much more worried about whether they need a circular driveway and a drop-off that flows mm -hmm. you know that kind of solution as opposed to parking on the street all around the neighborhood and walking down the street and I mean I just I want it to be a safety issue is right. mm. yeah well and I'm not sure that the other agency would be looking at traffic, traffic and parking. no so right. I think we do need to consider that or, or at the, the particular site right when the staff report was written up were were you was the planning office aware that it was increasing from right now 10 to possibly 27 because that sounds significant mm. It is that I guess it's the hours of operation that are not right and that are not exactly coincident with the peak hours that affect that sort of jam up the entire city, which is what the site plan approval criteria is about addressing uh, mostly the PM peak hours. Um, I don't think it was clear that there might be some trips after so many trips after four with staff leaving half hour later and that kind of thing. So that might be. Um, considered but I guess the other issue would be so you know we could look at those numbers again and see if maybe that needs to be adjusted but I think given the hours of operation it looked like it was sort of outside of that window okay yeah. Alan? I, <clears throat> I think the proposal is somewhat problematic because of the issue of lack of place to park cars and drop off kids and um, you know, as I said, I went down the street twice, and maybe it was all staff there, maybe it wasn't, but there were a number of cars parked there, and if there were going to be a half a dozen or more, could, could be a lot more people showing up in the same time slot to drop off kids, and I don't know where they'd park, and it seems like an inconvenience to the other people living on the block. You know, and I, I'm sort of troubled by these things. On the other hand, I'm struck by the fact that we have no one from the neighborhood who's here expressing their concern about it. So I don't know if they're not concerned. Maybe I'm not. It, it, on the one hand, it seems logical to, to think that if you're going from 10 to 27, that somebody's going to be impacted, you know, whether it's the neighbors or the parking lot across the street or somebody who will be inconvenienced. Actually, excuse me, it just occurs to me, maybe it's the fact that the neighbors didn't know it was such a dramatic potential jump in numbers. Did the applic did the notice um, say that? No, it was a daycare center, conversion of daycare It's center. just so, it, yeah, it makes it sound fairly innocuous. Maybe they'll be shocked to find out that the neighborhood could be flooded with parents dropping off kids and picking them up. I don't know, it just occurs to me. Right. Maybe, but I'm, I mean, it's, Jonathan's neighbors and he lives there and I would imagine if he's telling me he's met with him I, 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 I don't know what what that would have sounded like but I would have I would I would trust the best intent to sort of communicate to the neighbors what you're intending to do it, it, it seems like if we were to place a moratorium of you know whatever 18 months and say come back and check in with us that would be for our benefit not for theirs or certainly the neighbors because nobody's here complaining about it but well, it almost seems like it, it, it might be a self-policing type of thing that if it becomes so congested and so adverse to dropping your kids off that people are going to stop dropping the kids off and go somewhere where they feel, feel more comfortable and that will by default settle in on a, on a number that both the center and parents dropping the kids off are happy with mm -hmm. I, I'd push back on that a little bit I, I think if it were my two-year-old and I liked the, 
the business that that would override any convenient inconvenience of dropping right. off. I mean, I think that there are bigger issues that weigh in than that. Um, I I don't I know how many others were able to go down there are familiar with it. I mean, people with high mm -hmm. school kids know, but the street is. Um, in terms of, and I'm just saying this from my personal experience with daycare, I had, I, um, uh, my kids went to a family daycare, but it was on Nonatuck Street, and we had to park on the side, and the cars are going super fast there. And a street like that, I'd be very concerned about having lots of cars parking and kids having to walk. But these, street, these streets are much calmer, right. there's not as much traffic, and they're certainly not going that fast. So. I and, and I, I look at the street and I think about my experience and I think I would much rather <laughs> have to walk on this street right. to drop off than where I did. Um, you, you think about is it Meadow Brook or Meadow Lark across from the Meadow YMCA? Lark. Oh, Meadow Lark. Lark. Meadow Lark. And yes. that's, it's been there forever and it's very successful. But you see, yeah. Mom with little Timmy with a hand, you know, and running across Boston Street trying to beat traffic, and and that's that's another know, good example. Yeah, yeah, this is a this is a you know a hundred yard street that's. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing I like about the idea there is that there's already so much there's there's traffic that makes it, if you have to drop off your older child, I mean there's there's some convenience in the location that will cut down traffic movements to somewhere else. I mean. Daycare will have to be found, right. and so if it's not there near a, near a school, that also might involve a stop for a family. Um, so in some ways, I my traffic concerns come from two different sides. Yeah. And I kind of like where this is for that reason. I think there'll be a little bit uh, getting out onto Riverside or Elm is takes that dog leg there. That mm -hmm. never seems right to me that it's named Elm still, but um, you know there'll be the extra traffic coming and going twice a day onto that flow of traffic. Um, so I don't think it's this street, it's sort of that area that's going to pick up two dozen extra trips I twice agree, a but day. That, those two dozen trips pale in comparison <laughs> to, <laughs> what to else the high is going school. On? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. In terms of just traffic. And it's right. at a different time it's too, so right. it's not going to be colliding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else? So public comment still open. Will we close public comment? All in favor? Okay, so public comment uh, section is closed. Any discussion? I mean, it, it, it's all traffic. It, it's all traffic, but I think it's as good a traffic story as we might hear for a business that is needed. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where I am on it. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, having I used to work on riv off Riverside Drive, so I mean I've gone that way a million times. I, I think, <coughs> in some ways, it's like its own self-traffic <coughs> calming street because when there's cars on it, you just you gotta slow. Down. I mean, right. it's like you have to because mm -hmm. you I mean you feel that sense of you know like I gotta slow down here even before. Um, and I think I know the, the woman who used to live in that house. Um, you know, but even before it was converted, you know, I mean, it didn't take many cars for you to feel like, whoa, right. I need to negotiate this a little more carefully. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and there are practices. I mean, you know, even if they're just at the other end, you kind of start to, I mean, it's not a very long street. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah, I would, a lot of speed on that yeah, and I would no. say the same. I mean, whatever concerns we might have, people are apparently yeah. voting with their feet. And, and, you know, it is a business now. Uh, granted, this is a big increase, but it's not a change in the business. It's a change in the magnitude or whatever yeah I think I mean I would go ahead and say I'm, I'm in favor of approving it but I, I think we probably should debate the, the idea of putting any restraints or more to, or time frame on it or you know that would be my interest but just and I was the one discussing it but for the sake of argument if in 18 months they're up to 15 kids and all is well in the world and so we say okay you're good and then Six months after that, they're up to 25, and then it's too busy. Or you know, how is it a moratorium? Is it a time-based thing? A, a kid count thing? Is it a you're doing yeah? I I I I'm, I know you're taking the contrary position for the point, but I I don't know. I feel like the to put that kind of condition is in some way. I mean, would we put that kind of condition on a, on another business? Another? I don't know. It just feels like it's 
they're not able, you know, either they have a permit or they don't. And if they do, then they can plan and they can make decisions and go forward and maybe make those adjustments based upon, you know, what happens. But if they have those conditions, then, uh, you know, maybe, they're, they're maybe they keep it so it, it works, you know, and then, well, then what happens after the, you know, then, I, I don't know, it just, right. I, I don't know, something about it, it feels like it's like an artificial and it's just putting off right. the ultimate decision. And then I'm not sure it's fair to the, to the owner. And if they're moving out and, they, and somehow or another they were forced back into an alternative that was too small to balance both of them, then there'd be something else they'd have to sell or whatever. I, that, that's awkward, too. Right. Um, the real question is, has anybody looked closely enough at that yard to know whether or not there really ought to be a curb drop-off? Is that... Is that the question that would make the drop-off situation more tenable? I, I would argue that if, if it becomes so successful that it warrants a drop-off, then, then he might come back to us and say, we need a curb cut or we want to, you know, we're up to 26 kids and everything's great except traffic's an issue or drop-off's an issue and we propose a change to accommodate that. But I don't know if... I don't know, we can impose that now or make that a, a condition now based on what hasn't happened yet. I think it would be probably hard to pre determine whether or not that was an appropriate thing and if it would fix anything. Well, I, I, that I, yeah. I but, grant, but that's I guess, a specific is what I'm yeah. saying. I, I grant that. And I, and I think but, uh, um, you had made a good point about, you know, they could always come back and ask if, if they felt like, it was almost like your self-policing uh -huh. um, comment that, if it's a problem, they can come back potentially and ask for site changes that mm -hmm. make it work better. And I guess um, I think sort of going back to my other comment too about this time limited option, if the, if the use is allowed, but there may be it's too big of an impact to allow at the maximum capacity, that's the thing you should you might want to think about now. Whereas if you put it, say this is good for two years, and two people should come up and say, oh, the traffic is terrible what's that number you know how would you they're still allowed you just need to address the impact and so maybe it's a volume issue but i think so you know that's that would be the only thing i think that you could address if you had a two-year permit or something like that right. to say well it's too much impact for the neighborhood you're gonna have to pull back to so that's going back to saying even if the state allows 27 Right. We're adding this other criteria, saying that traffic will only allow 18, or traffic, we think traffic right. will only allow 20, right. or something like that. And it, and it, and also again, it's not. I don't, f and and it's not a matter of the whole street has cars parked on it because we allow parking on an entire street. Mm -hmm. Right. So it. Um, um, it's, so I think it would be hard to determine what that what that number, right. is. number is, and what it might. Be you know if it's not 26, does 19 work or, right. or 27? You know, I, I, it's it's so arbitrary. We, we don't have a traffic plan. Right. We we I have no reason to make that case that there's a number based on traffic. Yeah. And if it's a number based on square footage, that's EEC's right. that's business. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So I just I don't think that I feel that that's the right way to go with it. Yeah. I mean, I would be more inclined, I've, and I should say our upstairs neighbors use this daycare, so I've done drop off for them. You know, we, I've driven them there on two occasions, you know, between 8.15 and 8.30, and I was surprised how not trafficked it was. You know, I was surprised that we basically used Ormond Drive as a circular, you know, drop off, come right, in right. from the left. You know, I parked right in front of the house. There was some landscaping, you know, right up against the curb and I was surprised when we got in how many kids were already there you know and how quickly that process happened and it was like you're in hi bye and then we're out right. and so I would be more inclined for us to think about staff parking and you know ensuring that it sounds as if there's actually a benefit to changing the use because these this three-car household is now going to live somewhere else and only one of those cars is going to be you know back on site every day versus which brings me right. to the on-site parking. So it, as, a, as a resident, I have one curb cut and I can put as many cars in my driveway as live in my house. Three sounds like one too many, but <laughs> um, 
Maybe. So. <laughs> Hence the C-section. <laughs> but, um, but as a business, those cars count. Those cars count. I mean, in the same way that if I want to add six to a particular place, then you know, you have to come before the planning board to find out if six is right for that business. Mm -hmm. So it's different. That's the change for me when the residence goes to a business. The parking is no longer just a house parking. It's a it's a it's a business parking. So I think it would behoove us to say how many parking places on site because if you could pull all through the yard. I mean, as many well, cars right as would fit there. Two informal, quote unquote, informal parking spots. What if, right. because of the increase in kids, those become formal, not paved, but essentially formal parking spots. Right, well, and what I'm after is, I think it, it would, it's the right thing for us to do to say how many parking places on site there are associated with this new business. And then the ones that knowing, recognizing that there's more people that are gonna work there and they're gonna park on the street. I, I'm not in favor of trying to micromanage this. I, again, I'm, I'm really struck by the fact that none of the neighbors seem to care. Um, and uh, the, it, it could, the number of people and therefore the number of staff and the number of drop-offs will be floating up and or down. Um, and, and it's too hard to project any parameters that makes sense when we don't even know what it's going to be. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and there apparently is room on the street, so we're told. Uh, I don't know. I, I think it would be using artificial projections to try to establish now what should occur. And, and again, people in the neighborhood seem okay with it. For, for the sake of argument, what's the recourse if, because of the increase in kids and the center's doing very well, the front lawn becomes a parking lot, and every morning every, and every afternoon there are six cars parked. There's no lawn anymore. It's a parking lot, and the neighbors complain. Well, you're not allowed to have more than um, two parking spaces in your front setback, so um, I don't think there's a very deep um, yard. Right. So. You couldn't have. I mean, that's a that's a that could be potentially be a zoning violation unless the driveway were extend. You know, unless you extended it beyond that front setback. So that's one potential limiting factor. I guess the other thing, and and I think the um, uh, Mr. Vogelson spoke to it when he first started out was the board. I mean, they could create parking on site. But the concept is there's all this other parking, excess parking in the vicinity. Yeah. Why put more pavement mm -hmm. um, right. down on a parcel when you really got this entire parking lot that's rarely used, mm -hmm. certainly during the times at which this would be needed? Mm -hmm. So as a, I mean, you do have the allowance to say, look, there's plenty of public parking essentially in the vicinity. Why go and build more parking? Yeah. Right. So. I hear you, and the, the two is, is the number I wanted discussed? I mean, there. So you've you've heard that now that you know two in front of the house is already a part of the the zoning for right. that area. Right. And so yeah, and it does sound like there's enough parking other otherwise. But I if I'm, I'm I hear you, if I were the person next door and all of a sudden the yard next to me filled up with cars, I would I would be unhappy. And so I think that's what we're trying to sort of ferret out here. But then the neighborhood would have a recourse for that, right? Because yes. it would be a zoning. Yes. Right. Right. Okay. Right. So I don't think we have to artificially address that mm -hmm. now. It hasn't happened. A right. and it would be artificial because it may not ever be a problem. And if it is, then there's a recourse for that. I'm ready to make a motion. Okay. Uh, I make a motion that we approve site plan review daycare center by John. Bogelson at 11 Ormond Drive, Florence, map ID 23D37. Second. Second hand. All in favor? Any discussion? Good to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> you should have been here for the dog. Oh, the permit. Dog. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank Okay. We're getting together after the meeting. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs>
Just for the record, when did <coughs> Northampton turn into Florence? Like right after the high school, or? You have to check with the post office. There's yeah, it's right. <laughs> the street right over there, but that's, that's a long, I don't remember the name of the street. Is it Nutting? Not Nutting. Um, Federal? So it's not that it's the street that's right up against the property of the high school. That's the official border. Oh, okay. Milton? Mm -hmm. That's Milton. Milton. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's, that's Bay State. Really? Starts in, yeah, ah. that's, that's when Bay okay. State begins and Florence begins, and for some reason it's Okay. Good luck with the new baby. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, doke. So now I have some zoning ordinance amendments. Start with 10 10 B. So yeah. So um, we talked. I think you saw this iteration before it officially went to council. It was to um, address just um, the setback requirements for detached accessory apartments they've always been the same as a principal structure but when we reorganize the zoning some of the um, in the a b and c district anyway there's a graphic that shows for garages your detached structure can be four feet and um, there was a concern that that would be interpreted that any detached structure whether it's for a garage or a living unit could be so um, adding this language to the special permit section um, would just clarify that it's the same as for the principal structure. Right. So do you need a recommendation from us? Recommendation to council. We're, so what's going to happen is, you know, sometimes you have joint public hearings. These were pretty minor. Um, it's going to go, this is going to actually go to the September 22nd um, ordinance committee meeting for their public hearing. Mm -hmm. So your recommendation would go to them and then on to full council after okay. they're done with it. Do you need a motion or what? Yeah. Yeah. A motion to recommend to city council the, the zoning amendment. I move that we recommend the city council zoning ordinance amendments chapter 350.10.10B to clarify special permit criteria for detached accessory apartment setbacks. Second. Second test. All in favor? Okay, we're good with that one. And now 12-2. Light levels. No. Um, so um, this is um, to a couple of clarification. Well, one new um, concept and then a clarification is um, to clearly specify that the building commissioner has um, the jurisdiction to um, require uh, go out and actually assess um, the site and provide alternatives to the property owner to either come into compliance based on that assessment or to provide additional data from a certified lighting engineer. And that was, this is based on a, a request by the building commissioner to have this language added. Um, and the second piece is um, that there's just a basic standard that lights be turned off for businesses um, one hour after close of business. Um, that you typically do, or you do sometimes on site and plan approvals, but um, they don't always get into the permit and then. Um, now, this is not choose. all lighting. This is site lighting, right. so parking lot lighting. Just explain, I get the one hour before business closes, yeah. but the one hour before it opens. So well, like because business some opens at 10 in the morning. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's an allowance they can put, turn it on, but I don't think anyone would turn them on in daylight, but for businesses that open at 6 a.m. in the winter time, it's gonna be dark. Mm -hmm. So they mm -hmm. might so it's, site lighting on. It's yeah. site lighting, not necessarily building. Not building right. lighting. Right. Right. This right. is right. only right. for site lighting. Site lighting, okay. Yeah. Oh. So that People don't leave parking lot lights on. Exactly. And lighting I'm just saying, could you weasel your way through this wording and say, well, we don't open till 10 o'clock in the morning, so I'm going to leave my lights on all night? Mm -hmm. No. No. You need to. Unless you're 24 hours. Yeah, uh, after the close of business or one hour before the open of business. So could you turn them off at not 8 right. in the morning and turn them on at 9 or something? Right. Does it say one hour after? Yeah, it doesn't say all. It doesn't, right. it doesn't read. up until one hour before. It doesn't read quite. Yeah, it's confusing. Okay. Turned off. Two sentences then? Well, turn, do you want it turn, them turned 
on one hour before the open of um, business? The we allowance to be turned on. Okay, so I think you're losing. Must be turned on. It must be turned on. Permitted to be turned on. So I think you're missing the turn on. Okay. After the close of business and or up until one hour before the open. Of, yeah, I, do, I don't understand how it's worded. Right. I, I get the intent. I'm just wondering. Right. Yeah. But you're right. If you read it strictly, it, it yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Furthermore, it, 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 I think there should be a comma after business districts. And that doesn't alter that, that other thing, but it makes it read better, I believe. Pull up my text version. So I think I've asked before, Louis has a light meter that he yeah. uses, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And do we have a requirement for shielded lights? Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry. Is, this well, is, this, is this a, um, is this just a way of enforcing requirements that were already imposed or is it imposing a new requirement? Mm -hmm. The, um, the, Addition of um, the the timing and when sight lights no, need to be turned I'm off. I'm sorry. I'm thinking about the first one that oh. allowing him to go out and assess the level of lighting. Um, he already has that ability to do it well, in someone... general terms, but he requested he wants to be able to go and point to the ordinance to right. say, "This is why I'm here, and I can check your lights." So. Have have the level of light uh, always been regulated by the ordinance, or is that reg relatively recent? Um, lighting um, has been regulated for I'm going to say maybe 20 years, um, but in 2007, maybe. Um, I have to look at the exact date. Um, the lighting ordinance was changed to be much more specific about the maximum illumination levels based on zoning district. Even pre-existing lighting? Pre-existing lighting could, as long as it was in compliance with the previous ordinance, it was okay. Um, even if your illumination levels were, as long as you weren't creating glare, that was never allowed, you know, going back decades. Um, so there was more of an interpretation about um, whether your site was creating glare off-site. All right. Um, but he can't go out using this provision that is being proposed and determine that lighting doesn't comply with current ordinance, current requirements when they were in compliance when they were approved. Right. So let's say two, 2007 is the date that we made these very specific lighting. Well, take a harder case. What about a building that's been there for 20 years? Right. So a building that's been there for 20 years, we wouldn't, um, unless it had gone through a planning board approval, even 20 years ago we required, or I don't know how long, but we required um, photometric plans to show what your lighting levels are. So if you're not in compliance with that, that's one piece right. if nobody ever came if a building existed and nobody ever came through and got approvals um, they would be held to the standard that w the building lights were installed and that means no um, off lighting can't spread off premise mm -hmm. um, and it can't um, create glare so it could be that you had lights that were never installed properly and in accordance with the ordinance but it would be held to that standard not the 2007 standard Doesn't this language imply that it's, he can determine that it's in compliance with current requirements? Um, oh, I, it, it no. might, I mean, the intention is, I mean, we ha we've had, this is really about. It doesn't say if current light right, levels, are, light being, levels are, being are being met. It doesn't yeah, say light current. levels were not always regulated. Right. Then there aren't any. To I think I understand what you're saying, Alan, but. I guess I don't, I don't read it that. I I know I think you're concerned that I forgot my paperwork for someone's that someone's going to all of a sudden be held to a different standard. But I guess I don't read it that. Way. Well, the other the other piece of it is you. Well, it's not no, saying that because someone could say, well, I had this building and I've had it for 20 years, so automatically he is going to have to evaluate it based on the fact that it was installed at a time before 
the standards that are in effect now. It's just like any other use. When you go and, you, and someone complains about a use, he would go out or and one of the inspectors would go out and say, what, do you, what kind of business are you operating here? And the person will say, well, here's proof I've been doing this for 15, 20 years. And then building, the inspectors walk away and say, okay, you're fine. It's great. So light levels were, will then have been met because there were none at the time. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. okay. I, I hate to ask this, but is there a need to be more specific about the term business hours? Um, you know, not every business has posted business hours. I think about, you know, going to a meeting up, up the hill, you know, where the entire parking lot was still lighted at, you know, 8 p.m. because we had a night meeting there that was just sort of you know or if someone is working late but clearly that was well after all the other people who worked there had already gone home so how specific can we get with regard to you know if it is causing an impact on a neighbor and the business owner says oh well, you know we have someone who works late every so often so we're going to so that's not close of business because we still have some still well but okay. i guess well, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm asking you, does that, so the way it's worded is turned off one hour after the close of business. So even if you had, I mean, I would argue maybe this is false, but nobody else from the public can come to that business because they're done for the day. There may be a staff person working there, mm -hmm. but the business itself is not open for business. <laughs> business. Would you use that same logic to extend, because I was going to ask a similar question. Yeah. Um, say you had a assisted living facility. Is it open 24 hours a day as a nursing home? Yes. Mm -hmm. Those are 24 hour a day facilities, right. even though they may not be open to the public 24 hours. But, but they're, they're open, open. They're, but they're operating. They're, they're, they're operating. operating. They're operating. People can come and go. Their people can but the come staff, and go. The staff are coming and going okay. then, mm -hmm. yeah. And the same go, I mean, this came up for the hotel. Did you guys, you talked about that lighting mm -hmm. that, or maybe it was the zoning board with their signs. Um, the uh, Marriott, the Fairfield, yeah. oh, um, right. is a 24-hour business, right. obviously. So there had been a discussion at that level about whether the sign light should turn off at a certain time. But no, yeah, because so people are coming. Okay. Yeah. What's the impetus for this? Was there a problem that's being addressed? Well, actually, it's sort of, yes. I mean, I think the problem is that on some permits, you all put a permit condition that mm -hmm. says, you know, you're going to be done. There's right. no reason to have your lights on after, you know, your close of business. And then other permits, it just slips by the wayside because there's so many other issues that you're addressing and that the lighting meets the standards. And so then you have this um, mix and match of what's happening. And overall, the goal is not to have excess illumination that's, you know, um, has a negative impact on the environment. It went beyond the environment. It was in some neighborhoods where there were apartments around, and in, not in the building that was lit, but that the apartments were getting lights all night long. Yeah. And well, that's, so that's, that's you remember part like, of the environment, too. Too. But, but so this, and specifically, actually, um, we have, I don't know if you all know James Lowenthal, but he's um, a professor at Smith, and he's actually offered to come and give. Um, a session to the board about light levels and impacts um, to various um, um, different parts of our <laughs> community and environment. Um, but he had recently brought some pictures about some violations of the lighting ordinance up at Village Hill. Mm -hmm. And one of the sites he took was at midnight was the new mixed-use office building right, right at the corner. And it was midnight, and the whole site was lit up. There was no business. I mean, the building was dark. Nobody was inside. The entire site was lit. And it just didn't make sense to have, you know, an entire site. I didn't say that. I had no idea. That's exactly what I was thinking of. It. That's not, that's not a building where it's not like a retail storefront. People are coming and going. It's, you know, there's consultants up there. And so that's why I'm asking about, like, business hours and stuff. And how do we I mean, If you remember, like, at Apple Drive, we were very specific. You know, it was either 10 o'clock or one, after, one hour after closing, all the parking lights go out. Parking lights go out. But um, I don't actually remember, and we did talk about it, that, that corner lot at the village, uh, at the hospital, or 
It's not in the permit. Right, right, yeah. Right, right. But across the street, Cole Morgan, you were very specific yeah, about yeah. that. And that was particularly because there it's surrounded by residential yeah. houses. But you can tell the vast difference from one side of the street to the other. Right. Yeah. And obvious impacts that that has on the night so sky. What does the Cole Morgan permit say? It says the sight lights have to be off um, at a certain uh, and I don't remember they could maybe leave one light on or what have you but it was it was um, limited but it was based on their I mean there was a whole dialogue with the corporation to yeah. find a comfort level where they didn't really need sight lights because what they were doing inside the building on the third shift or second shift or whatever was not you know necessary to so this won't correct past things that this right. would just be going forward well it's also so that you don't have to remember to put it in right. each mm -hmm. permit that yeah. it's just a standard yeah okay how does people working late at night you can get the lights that flash on when when you get a motion detector right. and they stay on for a brief period of time and then they go off again right usually lights on or near right near the building would do right. that but parking lot lights yeah right but that's to light the for you to get to your parking lot place if you're working late as people do. Okay. So back to the wording on the second paragraph. Does anybody have any issue or suggestions? Or should we just leave it alone? Light shall be turned off one hour after the close of business and or up until one hour before the open of business. Well, I think, it seems like it seems needs to say and no sooner than one hour before, because yeah. because if you do read it yeah. just like that, it, it mm -hmm. does sound like you it's can almost off. say, well, it seems like I turned them off for an hour, but exactly. then I got to turn them back right. on. Right. <laughs> it seems and like it needs to say he turned on. Yeah, no, no sooner, sooner or something like that, yeah. or no earlier. I don't yeah. know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so one hour after the close of business, and may not maybe, but may be turned on mm -hmm. no earlier than one hour before the open of business, unless otherwise approved by the planning board yeah. through site plan review. And close of business is just whatever the business has stated mm -hmm. is their hours of operation. Yeah. So yeah. even if they're like a consultancy, our core hours are nine to six. Right. If yeah. you work till 10, you're on your own. Right. Okay. Okay. Unless you ask the planning board for reprieve. <laughs> okay, can I have a motion? Well, wait, back to Tess's. Do you want to say public hours of business? I mean, is that what you're actually trying to corner? Well, not necessarily. I mean, you know, if I own a consulting firm, I don't necessarily have, I'm not open to the public per se. I may have core business hours, but I don't know what language to use to indicate that there is this sort of, you know, standard of, I mean, we have to, it's got to be sort of, um, uh, there's got to be some reference that, you know, so, I mean, if public hours, I mean, I guess well, the sorry, could you, think could of you it use like, like standard business public hours, standard business hours, or something like that, and then even if you're mm -hmm. even if you're a non quote unquote a non public business, right? Yeah, I'm sorry to open that up, but right. you know. Alan's right. The the nursing home story is restricted by public hours, but yet it's a business open 24 right. hours. Right. 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 But I guess the issue is, you know, if you're a consulting business big enough to have your own building and a site right. then you're going to have hours that which you will take business right. and then you are no longer answering right. phones because right. you're doing yeah. other stuff right. 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 so yeah. it's so the business is stated hours of operation or so that's what that was what so we would the, go by i guess if, you, that, if you extend that though if you i guess it's somewhat like the situation at hospital hill i mean or um, <coughs> you know if someone built another potpourri mall Right. I mean, you have a huge variety of businesses. Is it each individual business? Is it the mall? That's the mall. I mean, that's the. I mean, that. I think it would be the it, entire because we're talking about the mall. site for the entire thing. So right. if one business stays open till eleven, then Do, the, then does the light stay on till? That's what the way I would interpret it. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. May I? May. I recommend. Uh, I move that we recommend to council z approval of zo zoning ordinance amendment chapter 350 12.2 to clarify building commissioners review and approval for site lighting add standard requirement site lights be turned off after close of business language as modified. 
Second. Second by John. All in favor? So moved. Okay. Now we have two sets of minutes to review and or approve, July 10th and August 14th, which I'm sure everybody has read. I did make some modifications based on comments from Devin, because she always sends me comments. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to trust Devin with her modifications? Second. Second. Second hand. All in favor? What else got? That's it. There you go. What's coming for the next one? So there's no meeting on the 25th, Rosh Hashanah. So the next meeting will be October 9th. And. We will have one, per, at least one permit, and then um, I think James. I'm going to schedule James Lowenthal to come in to um, give a little talk about that. And then it, Wayne may also tag team and give an update of where we are on star, the star rating, and the and explain more about star communities. Mm -hmm. Do you know if he's talking to energy and sustainability also about star? No, uh, not Wayne, uh, James. Oh, James. Is there, I mean, I think this is predicated because they're debating buying all new street lights downtown. Oh, he's been talking to uh, them, okay. and more specifically, Chris. Okay. This is more about um, violations that are around town, new projects, how we can tighten up permits to make sure that it's clear in the permits that um, uh, applicants are going to be held to a certain standard, why it's important, and talk you know applicants come before you and many times say oh that's too dim I we can't possibly see at night if we don't have you know ten times the amount you're telling right. us so it's, it sort of explains sort of the rationale behind all of that were any of you here when we I don't think so we were touring the city with light meter in hand mm -mm. that was a fun field trip going oh. to no miss that you had different applicants come and say we need lumen levels mm -hmm. of, uh, 50 mm -hmm. in order for the safety of our patrons and then so we were up and down King Street you know from Hess I remember Hess was particularly it was like this oh yeah oh yes you know, glowing Gas beacon want. Um, and versus other ones and and the variation was huge and we found that you know whatever it was you know eight is is fine and and uh, and I remember it came up on that on that is it gas station new, mini mart in yeah. East Hampton or headed right. to East Hampton that That's was the last right. time it, yeah. it came up so mm -hmm. um, not to drag this out, but I was just thinking, what if, a, to follow Alan's point about the lighting, on a pre-existing, non-defined um, parking lot situation, what if they change all the, the lamps, the light bulbs in their um, existing uh, parking lot lights and just totally violate any, if there was an existing uh, parameter, they yeah. violate it because of the efficiency of the new bulbs that are mm -hmm. in there. But since there wasn't a pre-existing thing, how, how is there well, such a change, scenario where? Yeah, I mean, if you're changing bulbs, then you have to put in bulbs that don't uh, um, create lumens that are greater than. But if there. Uh, so there was, there could be a mechanism for, for Louis to look at that. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Okay. So we had that actually at one a gas station, actually. They went hmm. ahead and changed all their canopy lights and had actually new fixtures. Once you're putting a new fixture in, you have to comply. Yeah, okay. You can't put in non-compliant fixtures. Um, I don't know if you want this on or off the record, but... Um, you're on? Yeah, the moratorium, our role, our, are we done with that? Are we... You're done with that. So it got held up again in... Um, so it was... Um, it, it was continued by City Council um, Ordinance Committee to the September 22nd meeting so that um, Councilor Donnell could have a public forum with uh, and um, Councilor um, Shara could have a public forum together. So that happened last this week, week, last week, last, week. Right? last Thursday, yeah, yeah. yeah. last yeah. Thursday. Um, and so since then, Housing Partnership had a meeting. It looks like um, Councilor Donnell and Shara are going to request that Ordinance Committee carry it forward one more meeting so that there's an additional iteration and conversation with housing partnership. Then it'll come back in October and then go
go to city council sometime either end of October or beginning of November. But you guys are done. You made your recommendation, and now it's floating along. Okay. Need one more motion. Motion, we adjourn. Second. All in favor.